welcome everybody to another episode of Tech Done Different. I'm your host, Ted Harrington, and with me here today is my special guest, Josh Little. Josh is the CEO and founder of Volley App. Josh, thank you so much for joining us here today. Oh, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. So where this originated, this conversation you and I, was when I first learned about your efforts to solve a problem that pretty much everybody listening to this is going to have. And that's the fact that meetings suck. <laughs> and we're all exhausted. There's just an endless array of meetings, uh, of Zoom meetings and video chats. And you know, here we are, of course, recording video. I'm making you go through it one more time. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but maybe you could talk to us a little bit about how you I recognize that as a problem and what you wanted to do in your pursuit of trying to actually solve this problem. Yeah, well, I've been thinking about this problem for over a decade. My second company called Bloomfire is a knowledge management platform. It was very much trying to get the right information to the right people at the right time. So it's always been a, a problem that I've been passionate about and interested in, especially as an introvert, uh, meetings are a hard thing. Mm -hmm. And so when we all went remote and uh, started working from home and uh, we still need to talk in order to move work forward, uh, that didn't change. Suddenly we're doing these back-to-back -back Zoom meetings all day because uh, Slack or Teams, you know, chat is only so good. Um, there's only so much you can say. And sometimes you just have to give that extra context. And you could write a book of an email, but we know that that'll take an hour. And we are elite athletes uh, when it comes to conversation as human beings. Uh, we can speak seven to eight times faster than we can compose written communication. So, kind of putting all of that together and falling in love with asynchronous video communications on several different platforms that I was using. I thought, you know, we need this kind of communication in the workplace. And so that was the genesis of Volley. There you go. And so you've, you've essentially made it so that we don't have to schedule time, but we can still have that sort of uh, the interaction and a lot of the nonverbal cues or even tone of voice and things like that, that might happen that totally get lost in, in email. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I mean, social scientists say that 93% of communication is tone of voice and body language. It, the, the content, the actual words of what I'm saying are only about 7%. So if we're using written communication, we're trusting a very thin medium for what's potentially a very thick message, especially with work. There's a lot of communication that's emotionally charged. There's agendas on the line. There's, you know, deadlines to be hit. Um, so uh, Volley allows you to communicate um, in, a, in an asynchronous video conversation. Now, what does that even mean? Well, just like this conversation, we, uh, we take turns. But um, with Volley, you record your turn on video. And that gives us the flexibility of texting, but the richness of talking or allows mm -hmm. us to have productive conversations that don't interrupt each other's productivity. So, so that sounds like a lot of words. Some, some people are like, wait, I still don't get it. Well, it's like video texting that think of like video texting. What would that be like? Um, that's kind of the, the solution that we're bringing to market and, and trying to solve this problem, which we believe is death by meetings. One of the things I'm always interested in talking with uh, technology entrepreneurs about is the process by which a problem is identified and then the business around it is is actually established. So um, you just obviously helped us understand how you looked at a problem and said, okay, that doesn't feel good. And then there's all this science behind why this just isn't a great world to be living in. But how does someone who's listening to this show and maybe has also themselves identified a problem What's the way that you think about going and establishing a business around a problem? Because certainly you, know, you could be pa passionate about the problem all day long, but if there's not a way to make money about it, then you're sort of, you're sort of sunk. So in your experience, how have you thought about that? 
yeah, this is the process of validation. I keep a list of hundreds of ideas and problems I'd like to solve, things that I wish could be better. And I have a little rubric that helps me objectively judge which of these ideas are actually worth working on. But that doesn't mean I work on it. In fact, um, over the last two years, I went through a validation process with 12 different ideas from pickles to car air fresheners to different software product ideas to RV park rollups and whatever. And all of them just weren't valid for one reason or another. One that you said was uh, making money. Another might be that I can't find the right resources to solve this problem the way that I want to. Um, and so, I mean, a lot's been written about this in the world of entrepreneurship, books like Lean Startup by Eric Ries and Steve Blank's work at Stanford um, talk about this customer development or this process of validation. But that's the first step. Uh, before you go and build a business, build a very crappy prototype and show it to someone who might want to use it and just start to get their feedback and start to form the idea of actually how to solve it. Um, because I am guilty of this as many entrepreneurs. Um, sometimes we just go off with our own blinders and think, oh, I know how this problem needs to be solved. And we get blank stares. I, I actually had that with my last company called Quizzer. We built a quiz tool for teachers and trainers, like the world's simplest quiz tool. And, and have, I have a background in education and I've built the learning tools before. I was like, oh, I know what quiz tools need to look like. And they kind of gave it blank stares. And at the same time, marketers and publishers found Quizzer and started to embed quizzes on their site. And they would just blow up like ESPN and Fox News and whoever. And we're like, oh, okay, this is for you, not them. Okay, well, we're gonna cut these features off. We're gonna build these features for you. So it's, it's always a journey. And the, the worst thing you can do is think that you know everything. Yeah, and inherent in what you're saying is a really interesting insight too that has actually come up on this show a few times before, but the idea that in a lot of ways, you are what the market tells you you are. And you thought you were building this e-learning solution and instead it's more of a marketing solution. And what was the process for you like to recognize that? I mean, certainly there was the obvious like, oh, these other people are using it. But once you recognize that maybe it was gaining traction in ways unexpected for you, how did you evaluate how to allocate time, effort, money, and other resources in order to go through that pivot? Because that's obviously not trivial to do that. For sure. It's a great question. With Quizzer, it was just, you couldn't not see it. We had teachers and trainers using quizzes, sending it to three people reluctantly, and then somebody embeds it in their site and a million people take a quiz. And it was just like, oh, okay, that's a much more valuable use of this technology. Okay, we got it. So it, it, it really just kind of knocked us over the head with Quizzer. With Volley, we're actually going through this right now. And what's interesting, just in the last couple of days, what we're hearing from users is this, the surprise benefit of these asynchronous video conversations is that it's bringing back the, the fun and the spontaneity that we once had as a team, but then we lost. And um, turns out like all of these little you know, conversations in the hall or around the water cooler or walking out to the parking lot where we tell stories or jokes didn't seem like anything in isolation, but when you sum them up, it equaled relationship. And so what we're hearing, you know, like Buffer's state of work, remote work uh, study last year said that one of the top two uh, problems with remote work, um, you know, declared by remote workers is loneliness. Um, because we have to schedule a Zoom call to tell a joke. Um, and we're just not going to do it. Um, and we're not going to trust text to deliver my, my magical comedic timing. So I'll just forget about the joke or whatever that is, right? So we're kind of evaluating, like, what does this technology actually do? We thought it was solving death by meetings, but maybe not. Maybe it's bringing back that fun and spontaneity or increasing connectedness or who knows. So it's it's always an evolving process. Yeah, that's, that's pretty fascinating that, of course, you identified an unexpected you know, benefit to what you were doing. You didn't even set out to do that. And this this great thing happened. Um, so 
let's talk about the sort of timing of solving a problem like this. Obviously, you're, <laughs> you're running a business that's so trying to solve the death by meetings problem at a time that the world has forced us to be death by meetings. Was this something that the, the circumstances around you, the pandemic, forced you into action? Or were you already in action and the pandemic uh, essentially facilitated what you were already doing? Kind of both. Uh, as I mentioned, I'd been thinking about solving this problem and had attempted to solve it in a different way for over a decade now. But it was really the pandemic that kind of brought the focus of in, in my love of asynchronous video communication and my love of this problem. And I was like, ah, OK, chocolate and peanut butter. Let's put these together. Uh, so, yeah, it was actually a, a long road trip where the idea kind of just distilled and the name of, came to me. And I was like, by the time I got home, I called some friends that I've wanted to build a company with for a long time. And the next day we started a company together. Oh, that's, that's a great origin story right there for sure. And I like the idea of what you just mentioned, taking two things that are great, you know, you describe it as chocolate and peanut butter, I think, and, and put them together. Uh, you know, I, I actually right here on my whiteboard, I have a list of different things that I'm passionate about and different skills that I have. And I'm like constantly thinking, how can I tie those two together in order to, you know, put more value out into the world because of the things that I'm good at and the things I like doing. And as I was looking at this list, I'm like, wow, so, some of these actually go really well together. Like I love travel. I like, I love writing and I love running. I'm like, could I write about running in other cities around the country or around the right. world? And it's so amazing when you sort of put those together. So what's your advice? You clearly have done it. You took two things, put them together and made a business out of it. What's advice to other people who maybe haven't connected those dots yet? How do you connect dots? Ooh, that, that's a good question. I, I hate the I hate the answer because I know how it will be judged, but it it's kind of comes with, with from within for some reason. You just feel called uh, a certain direction. Now, I, I like I said before, I I felt kind of called in twelve different directions before I landed where I'm at currently. But I think that calling needs to be met with um, tangible evidence that what you're doing actually matters and actually solves the problem that you think that that, you, that the medicine will cure the disease and, and that's the process it's easy to find out do people want to take the medicine you can do that with running some google ads or some facebook ads and you just kind of you know know okay people will click on things that say that this solution exists but much harder to make sure that your product the medicine actually cures the disease and i i am guilty of pushing too early um, in past ventures on the growth button too early, but I'm getting beyond your question now. Um, but it, it's really a back kind of to the process of validation and making putting a crappy prototype in front of someone who could potentially buy or use your product and just seeing uh, if they would use it and asking would they pay for it. Yeah. Now, if I understand correctly, you're you're on your fourth company, I believe that you've started. That I talk that, about, yeah. That, <laughs> that you talk about, okay. Right. We'll, we'll we'll stay in that context. Uh, so you've you know you've been down this road a few times, um, and so I'm sure you've succeeded, and I'm sure you've also run into failure. If you think about, I think there's so many great lessons that come out of failure, and so I'm not trying to put you on the spot and talk about things you might be embarrassed by, but uh, we can learn so much from failure. So yeah. is there an example that you can think of? from prior companies or, or even your current company where you tried to do something and it didn't work out and sort of what the lesson was from that, that uh, our audience can take away? Yeah. Well, how much time do you have? Cause I've got thousands <laughs> of them, but uh, some, some of the most painful happen to kind of be the most personal and harder to talk about. Um, but uh, two just quick that I'll mention is uh withholding or, or sorry avoiding conflict with co-founders that that has been a hard one for me because uh co-founder relationships are kind of like a marriage in some way like we're in this together you know i'll uh richer for poor death do us part sort of 
thing and that's the romantic idea but the reality is we have a business to build and if you're getting in the way of that i have to we have to be able to talk about this and that's that's been one of the hardest thing um and another one uh is mistaking subject matter experts for co-founders um so starting a company with someone who's an expert uh in an industry but really has no interest in entrepreneurship or building a company together i kind of learned that lesson early one of the ventures i don't talk about because it just never amounted to anything but um that you know i i i i chose uh, a couple subject matter experts and there's three of us in the room and i was like i don't know how do we split equity third 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 there's three of us that would make sense right and then they went off and did one percent of the work and i did 99 percent of the work and had my whole team build this whole solution and then was selling it and realized oh this is this is not going to work in the way that we divided so just early, early mistakes uh just being new and ill-equipped to be an entrepreneur i i did not have the right tutelage or background or mentorship around me. Right. Now you mentioned the idea of conflict amongst your co-founders. So to clarify the, the failure that you learned from, are you saying that the mistake was you avoided dealing with the conflict or that you put yourself in a position where the conflict was detrimental? Uh, well, kind of both uh, eventually, um, but avoided dealing with the conflict is is kind of the root of, of the the problem there. Um, just, you know, the kind of look the other way, do no, you, you can do no wrong sort of thing, and I'll always have your back. Well, that kind of turned around and bit me um, in the end. So it eventually led to, uh, you know, the the, I don't, I would, I don't want to say the demise, but a, a huge, a huge, you know, 10 X reduction in, in the value of the company um, and kind of a blow up of, of the, of the leadership team. Uh, like I said, these things are hard to talk about without giving specifics and they're very awesome. personal, um, you know, and there's a lot of invest. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I, I guess I haven't found a great way to be descriptive about that, but that, that's been, that was the problem treating co-founders as if they, we were uh, like death to us part sort of married and having like a different set of standards for them as I would for a team member who I can certainly hold accountable and, and say, hey, you're not doing this and this is why we hired you. I, I didn't have the, the same set of rules or expectations for co-founders um and now i do and uh, yeah. i've learned from that um and this time i won the co-founder lottery uh, we've all built successful wow. companies before we've all failed before um it's it's been really great uh, working with uh, like true professionals and people at the top of their game oh that's that's great to hear it come out so positive on the other side and you know what you're we were talking about here around conflict is it's such a human problem, right? That we all face, not just in our professional lives, but in our personal lives too. And I think as humans, but especially in the workplace, we're sort of wired to, to not make a big deal out of stuff, right? It's like, oh, I don't like the way that was said or where that was done, but I'm just going to sweep it under the rug. It's like, not a big deal. Not, this isn't the bat, the hill that I'm willing to die on. And um, I've certainly experienced exactly that challenge as well. And when you don't, address it, that all it does is fester. Whereas if you do address it, the other person's like, oh, I didn't know. Okay, well, now we change it. And mm -hmm. uh, that's hard. That's hard for people to, to deal with that. Um, yeah, the hard part for me was having a way to talk about it, having a way to address it. Um, and the, the Vital Smarts book, like Crucial Conversations and all the others mm -hmm. were super <laughs> instructive for me, like giving me a framework for, how to even bring this thing up in a way that's not confrontational and it isn't sacrificing the currency of our relationship to be able to talk about these things. I, I didn't have those skills naturally and I had had to learn them, develop them, you know, it took a while, but, uh, but just having a way to think about, you know, content pattern relationship or some framework to think about how I'm going to bring these things up with others has been super helpful. 
Yeah, that's great. So I want to uh, pivot a little bit here and talk about uh, knowledge transfer and how we build leaders and, and everything. And uh, I'm going to brag for you a little bit. I've, I've seen from afar the way that you have been, you know, raising your daughter into this uh, entrepreneur and she's building this super cool business. Um, how have you gone about instilling those types of ideas in other people? You're obviously a passionate uh, founder yourself and you build teams around you. How do you, how does one, you know, translate that to other yeah. people so that they are equally excited about uh, making things happen? It's a great question. Cause it's, that's a really hard thing because the people that know the most or are the best at this craft have no reason to like, uh, build another little business teaching people how to do what they do. It just has to come from the heart. Like I, I cared about, and I personally happen to care deeply about helping others along because, um, you know, I kind of had a reluctant path into entrepreneurship. I was ill-equipped. I didn't know what I was doing. Like the first week I started a company, I showed up at the chamber of commerce and said, I'm here. What do I do? And they were like, what do you mean? What do you do? <laughs> I was like, I don't I, exactly. That's the problem. So uh, I, I think, you know, the answer to your question really is all about example and leading by example. And if, if, if you um, do lead by example, then people will reach out to you and you'll have opportunities to mentor. And I try so hard to give of my time to anyone who is interested in in mentorship or needs feedback on their idea just because i had such a hard time finding anyone to mentor me and and being willing to give their time so at the detriment sometimes of my own ventures or my personal time or my family time i will spend time mentoring others because i care now as far as my daughter i don't know that i can take much credit i think parents take way too much credit when their kids do something great and way too little credit when uh, the, or vice versa, right? Yeah. They take way too little credit when their uh, kids do something poorly and way too much credit when the kids do something great. Maybe that's what I was saying. Uh, <laughs> I got you. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, my daughter has built a, a little burgeoning empire and uh, it's fun to watch her, but I don't know. I don't know how much it was really me yeah. or, or just that being kind of in her from the beginning and just me helping coax it out. Sure. I'm sure some, some of both, no doubt about it. Probably. You know, it's when I think about like my own leadership philosophy, my principle is to build leaders that are capable of building leaders because if I can do that, then my impact is exponential. It's not just the people that I touch, but if I can make them, you know, able to, to grow others. And so one of the things that I've seen and trying to like study that idea, how do I, how do I do that better? It's, um, it's looking at the way that other people do exactly what you um, have been mentioning, be a mentor, be available and uh, have people taken you up on that. I mean, here you are talking about it on a, on a, uh, on a show that many, many people are going to hear. Do people respond positively when they hear you say that? Uh, sure. But in my opinion, not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, like this is something in some switch is flipped in my mind that I, I think I can just talk to anyone that I want to talk to, whether it's Richard Branson or, you know, Meg Whitman or whoever. Um, I don't have that filter that, oh, you shouldn't talk to this person or you're, you're not, you're not able. Uh, so I, I really feel that about others. Like um, I'll, I'll speak in universities a lot and I really, I'll put my email up in front of them and say, Hey, do you reach out to me? We'll go to lunch or something. And usually I get a, a few uh, that will be brave enough to do that, but probably not the people that needed to do that um, always. Uh, so, so yeah, yeah. Reach out. Uh, you find me on Bali. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how we do encourage the more reticent people to participate. Cause I, I'm hundred percent with you and I share, I share the same promise that you're making right now to anyone listening to this, that uh, I'm really interested in mentoring people. And I've run into that same problem too, right? You, you speak yeah. to a class of you know 50 students and like one follows up and you're like, man, the other 49 of you, I want to help you. Um, 
what mm-hmm. are what are some of the things that you've seen that people do respond to? And if if mentorship isn't one of the things, is it? Are, are, do people respond positively to? I don't know job options to compensation. Like, how do we get people motivated around our ideas? Well, I, again, another. You're good at pointing out these these hard problems, right? Uh, <laughs> because it's so hard to learn from the mistakes of others, you kind of have to make your your own mistakes. And I think, you know, entrepreneurship is a good mix art with science and the science can be taught. Uh, although the science isn't exactly, it's like a soft science uh, because what worked for this person may not work for this other person for a thousand different reasons and which are complex. So the art part of that is is the hard part to teach and hard part. And I think, you know, you give a, a, a good example like um, internship opportunities. I've, I've welcomed internship um, interns in the past that have wanted to just do what I'm doing. And, you know, I give them way too much responsibility too early. I have one of them right now who um is shouldn't be doing the things that he's doing but uh but i i just give them to him and he rises the challenge and he learns and kind of you know levels up with each one of them he's a student and um yeah so uh he's, he's very involved in volley and, and has been instrumental to uh us being able to do what we've been able to do it seems to me that maybe one of these barriers that gets in the way of people taking advantage of opportunities of people like yourself saying, hey, I'm available as a mentor, and then people don't jump at it, is probably fear to a certain extent, fear of like, are they going to waste your time? Are they worthy? Um, what happens if they reach out and you reject them in some way or they otherwise fail? And certainly fear is you know, the core of what stops a lot of people from entrepreneurship. How do we overcome fear? You've obviously done it. And what's the advice for people? Yeah, yeah. One of the values that are written on our wall at home, the little family values is be brave enough to try. And um, this is a lesson I learned early in life. I I bought a 1986 Toyota 4Runner and had a blown head gasket. And a friend of mine had a Toyota 4Runner and he liked to work on cars. And and I asked him, hey, do you know how to change a head gasket in a 4Runner? He's like, oh yeah, bring it over to my house on Saturday. So I bought the parts and did. And when I got there, he started like just pulling parts off of the thing, pulling parts off of the thing, just, you know, and I'm flying with him. And then he starts putting some things back on. And I was like, wait, do you know what you're doing? And he was like, no. I, <laughs> I was like, have you ever done this before? No. Wait, hold on. We can't do this. And he was like, it's just nuts and bolts. They're not smarter than us. We can figure it out. And it was just like, what? (laughs) You can do things that you've never done before. I know how dumb that sounds, but uh, it's most things come down to you just being brave enough to try. And if, if you're brave enough to, I mean, that's why I'm an entrepreneur. I, I shouldn't be an entrepreneur on paper. Uh, if you look at my background and where I grew up and my experiences around me, I just didn't, you know, I went to the Chamber of Commerce for, is a perfect example. Um, but I was brave enough to try and um, my willingness to learn was very high. And so I think between the, the bravery Um, and the overcoming fear and the willingness to learn, you can really accomplish anything. So I I don't know that I've um, overcome fear. Fear is always going to be there. But I think I've developed the confidence that um, through through being brave enough to try and willing willing to learn that I can, I can do things that I never thought and many people thought weren't possible. Yeah. Did you fix the car? We did. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it, it worked. It, believe it or not, it worked. It was it was a total fiasco. Uh, many weeks and taking heads in, getting them milled and finding shavings in the valves and, you know, all the problems we encountered, but all learning experiences. And they're why I 
confidently tear things apart in the garage today uh, because once upon a time somebody fixed the head gasket that shouldn't have yeah. wow that's that is a great story i'm glad you told that and it's interesting uh the way you describe fear that like you don't ever really get over fear you just sort of maybe acclimate to it or uh, adapt a level of confidence to deal with it and i certainly felt that when you know i was writing my book that was one of the big things that we had to think about is you really put yourself out there and what if i write a bad book and all this stuff and then but as, as soon as you acknowledge the fear then you can do something about it so if the fear is oh i'm gonna write a bad book it's like okay well how do you solve that you write a good book okay what does it take to write a good book and then you just sure. reverse engineer that and then it gives you exactly what you have to do and so maybe that's the kind of thing that people need to be thinking is like you guys reverse engineered how to take how to fix this engine you figured it out right yeah if this goofy looking fat guy can be an entrepreneur you can too like that that's the message uh, don't let fear get in your way uh because you can do it it's it's not rocket science um but it is you know a soft science like like yeah. i said i love it well certainly it seems like your entire mindset and your worldview is exactly the show you know doing things differently. Yeah. Uh, if, if you look back on the different experiences you've had, is there an example or two that you can think of where you're like, this was my favorite example when I totally did something different. Everyone thought X and I thought Y. And here's what I did. Is there uh, something that jumps out for you? For, uh, doing things differently. Um... Yeah, yeah. I've, there, there are probably, I'm trying to think of a really good one. I, I've been that way my whole life. Like if something is popular, I by definition don't like it. Like if a restaurant has a line, I'm so not interested in eating at this restaurant, right? And I know it probably has a line because they have really good food, but I, I've always kind of want to go the other direction and, and chart my own course. And that that's left me building lemonade stands out in the middle of the desert where no one is, um, unfortunately, but um, that's also led me to strike, you know, new discoveries before it was time, like, um, like Bloomfire, uh, for example, my second company, when I built it, it was a lemonade stand in the desert, the, 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 the workplace was not ready for a social environment. Bloomfire was essentially closed social for your workplace, uh, sharing knowledge with with um, your coworkers, and people just weren't ready for that. Building a, a learning community. Twitter just launched. Um, so today, Bloomfire is one of the premier knowledge management platforms, and yes, this is just a thing that we do. Um, but uh, then it wasn't, and I I feel very similarly with what we're doing now. Uh, having asynchronous video conversations is a new thing. We, we don't quite know how to use these things yet. Um, it's, uh, you know, what if, what if someone doesn't respond? What if I say something wrong? Can I take it back? You know, there's all of these questions about a new technology or a new format of communication. And um, I think, you know, now I know that it's, it's just going to take a while for people to kind of grasp hold and, and get the benefits of of this this new format of communication and luckily i'm more patient in my older age to to be able to wait for such things and kind of work with people and bring them along oh, i love it yeah patience certainly that's that's an earned virtue isn't it <laughs> you know, uh, we yeah. start out and we're like it has to be now it has to be yesterday and then as we mature we realize okay well we, we can be patient uh, for things for sure. Yeah. I'm sure everyone on my team is cringing right now because I just said that I was patient. Probably not people that know me, <laughs> but it's easy to say on a podcast. You don't yeah. know me. I'm really patient. Look at me. I'm sitting in front of green foliage. <laughs> yeah. All, all your people are like this liar is talking about patience <laughs> and he's, he's going to send me an email as soon as this episode's over yelling at me to get it done. Right. Right. So how do you, I mean, this is an interesting segue actually into uh, priorities, right? So in any, any emerging company, really any company, but we're talking about companies yeah. that are, you know, on the starting end of their spectrum, you have so many competing priorities. 
and you only have limited resources of money and person power and time and everything is urgent <laughs> and everything is critical. And if you don't do this, like in three weeks, we might be out of business. What is your process by which you prioritize where you're going to invest that time and effort and where you're going to be pushing your team to say, I don't have patience on this thing and those other things I can have patience on. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. And it's one of the principles I teach when I speak at universities is um, to relentlessly pursue the most impactful thing. And that's a really hard thing to do. Like you said, when uh, there are thousands of things you can do and with a startup, you're not exactly sure which of them are the most important and to who and who your customer is. You're, you're learning all of those things simultaneously. So I like to uh, ask this question of myself. And, and when I ask this question, it does seem to like narrow it down quite a bit. And the question is, what would insert the name of your favorite entrepreneur do? Hmm. So what, let's use Richard Branson. Uh, I actually couldn't give you like a paragraph on Richard Branson, but I just like the way he lives. And yeah. so what would Richard Branson do? If he became CEO of Volley today, would he do what I have on my list of things to do? And the answer to that is almost always, heck no. He wouldn't, <laughs> he wouldn't be writing copy for a LinkedIn post and figuring out transactional email this and whatever. He'd be like going to do a deal with this huge multinational corporation. He'd be on a yacht somewhere, uh, like uh, creating an awesome video about the lifestyle of his brand or, or whatever. Like it, so when you ask that question, and Richard Branson may not be the thing for you, but that's for some reason I always insert him, um, then it comes pretty clear. You know what? I shouldn't be doing any of these things. These are not high impact. What could I do that's high impact? Maybe I don't have a yacht. Maybe I can't do a deal with a multinational brand, but I could certainly reach out to some of the medium-sized companies that I know or people at those companies, and and that would probably both inform me with my product and maybe give them a solution that they need. And again, getting out of your comfort zone, getting over fear, you have to be brave enough to try. But if you can kind of put those things together, you can get somewhere. So that that's my little, little question I like to ask to hopefully relentlessly pursue the most impactful thing. I'm sure I'm not doing it most of the time. Yeah, but I mean, the fact that whether you are or not, I mean, that's in a sense almost immaterial because the fact that you ask that question in the way that you ask it means that you probably are, or at least are in the right range. You know, maybe if you're not hitting the bullseye, maybe you're hitting just to the right of it. Other, if you didn't ask that, you might not even be throwing at the dartboard. Yeah. And so that's really powerful. I love it. Yeah, you know, last week, actually, I, I kind of put my hands up and said, look, here's what I have on my list to do. I, I went to the team and I said, is this the most impactful thing I can be? These are the most impactful things I can think of right now, but I might be blind. So mm -hmm. I went to my co-founders and the rest of the team. And I was like, if you can think of something that's like on your mind, like, why doesn't Josh just tell me, please tell me, I want to know. So you have to be vulnerable enough to uh, be able to accept the answer to that question if it's not what the, the, the things that are on your, your task list as, as well, um, which is also challenging to do uh, when you're a leader. Sure. Well, Josh, you've been, you've been awesome, man. It's been so fun talking to you. Uh, as we wrap up here, one last question. You know, if you pull out your, your crystal ball and you sort of take a look at what's what's coming next from from your worldview. Um, if we were to say in the next 12 or 24 months, what's coming around the corner? Well, we're going to see the future of work start to unfold itself. Uh, we had, you know, a, a world changing event last year with the pandemic. And I, th I think the world is permanently changed. Um, Sure, we'll go back to the office someday, at least some of us, some companies will. But I think a lot of people have found new ways to work that are that are more meaningful, um, that 
give them more freedom and flexibility. And so I, I think the future of work is really going to be more flexible, more remote. Um, and uh, we're, we're just figuring out the tool set that enables us to do those things. So I think we're going to see a number of tools be developed to enable this, this future that we, we kind of see, but we can't quite get to given the the tool set and the, the culture that we have right now. So I think we're going to see a lot of cultural norms be broken and new tools emerge. And that's why I'm excited to be kind of part of that and playing as, as one of the players there. It's, it's fun to be doing um, tech differently. <laughs> tech done differently. Ah, I messed it up. Sorry, Ted. <laughs> hey, you're in the right ballpark. It's all good. Good. Well, Josh Little, founder and CEO of Volley App. You're the man. Thank you so much for spending time here with us uh, together today. And for everybody listening, if you want to participate in the show as a podcast guest or otherwise get involved, just go to tedharrington.com backslash podcast and we'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.